Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 310, The Paths Leading Up to Unplugged and Totally Uncut. You're listening to Chuck Boozer on Second Thought. Arrow Collins. Good morning, Arrow. Good morning, man. Good to, mor- to hear your voice. My God, I'm so glad that you're back on that. Well, me too. Uh, I was hanging around the house too much. I was hanging around the house too much. And for those of you who don't know, Arrow uh, was on the air for many, many moons here in Charlotte on, uh, oh gosh, you were on uh, WBT, uh, BCY 107.9, um, uh, whatever it is now. I'm not sure what it is now, but you were on Easy 104. Yes. You came with us. I'm trying to remember what year you came with, and I think it was e- we were Easy at the time. It was 104.7, but yeah. it was Easy at the time, owned by Easy Communications. When was that, 85, 86? Yeah, you got it, man. You've got- You've still got your memory, dude. Jeez. Well, that's about all I got. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and so I remember when you came, and here's the great thing about Arrow, y'all, because in the days when Arrow came, and I can't believe it's been that far back, Arrow. Can you, can you, can you believe that you and I are still talking that many years later? Oh, man. You're the only person in radio that I've talked to this long. Wow. Un- unbelievable. I'm not sure if that's a – is that a plus? Okay. No, no, that's a all plus. Right. That's a plus. We can always turn to each other. We always have always done that. Well, a great way to get yourself uh, in those days was when we used to send cassettes, and that was your, your audition tape. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, Errol knows where I'm going with this. Um, people would try to get noticed because cassettes would come in, and we'd use them to air check stuff. And you could sit with a PD somewhere, and he'd go through the air check session, and you'd hear about, you know, if, if you got checks, air checks from all over, if this was a job somebody wanted, you'd have 50 air check tapes. Yeah. And they were some of the good ones and some of the bad ones. And uh, you'd have about 15 seconds, boom, it'd be gone. That'd be somebody's air check tape. Boom, there's another one. Somebody's air check tape. And Arrow's air check and resume came in a bounce box. Yes. And we we knew this was about an unsealed bounce box. <laughs> and we knew that there was a resume and a tape in there. And we looked at this thing, and I mean we, the staff, all the air guys, because we were like, wow, okay, you've got somebody's attention. You know, um, and we wondered. This is completely sealed up. How did he open this and then seal it back to make it look like that? So you want to tell the story on that, Errol? Yeah, what happened was I was I remember being up at uh, the library in Billings, Montana, and we came across the call letters of the station. And I and I kept saying, man, this is just rolling off my tongue so very easily. Easy 104 FM. And so and, and Brian was with me at the time. He was almost like a producer when I was on Cook. And and the thing is, is that he says, just send him an air check, but you've got to be different because Brian was from Philadelphia. And he says, the only way you're going to get attention is you got to be different. So what I did was I took the bounce box and I very carefully opened it up, but I resealed it with super glue so that you couldn't tell that it was, uh, that it had been opened up. And, and the goal was to take the static out of any problems of finding somebody to do seven to midnight radio. And obviously it must've worked. Well, it did work. We, uh, we decided to hire you. I say we, I wasn't, uh, but we all said, man, this is creative. And we thought somebody that's that creative is probably going to be creative on the air. And you work. I think you started doing nights for us, didn't you? Immediately. Yeah, 7 to midnight. But but the goal was to make sure that we did nights in, in a very different way. And thank you know thanks to Bill Conway, he understood that I, I love doing specialty programming, so he gave me that, that task of putting 10 at 10 together, and, and that, that started everything. Yes. So uh, in the day also, I don't. I was there about eight and a half years, I think, at Easy Communications. It became K, it became Star, it became Mix uh, during those times. Uh, it changed, same frequency, but, but it changed the moniker and stuff. And you uh, did several things. I remember you were also at one time, and people say, really? But you were, well, let's bring him in to talk about it. Uh, have you got a second, Casey? Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I do, Chuck. As a matter of fact, uh, as one time, I was going to step down from the big, you know, uh, big voice in the sky, the countdown man, and I decided I needed a replacement. And Errol <laughs> Collins was number two on the list. Errol, what was the story? I mean, what, what happened? You actually tried out, and you were like top two or three, weren't you, to replace Casey Case? Absolutely. I, I beat out Donnie Osmond. And uh, so, but, but Sh- Shadow Stevens got it. But hindsight, though, I totally understand, and, and I've learned through the... Through the ranks of Ryan Seacrest that you can't go to Los Angeles as a nobody. You've got to go out there as somebody. And and so I, I learned from that. Is, I mean, I was just some 25-year-old kid from, from Charlotte, North Carolina that was trying for this big job. But it's something that I've been doing my entire life, specialty programming such as Countdowns. And so it, it just felt really fun to be able to have that opportunity. So it says these days when we Wikipedia you that you're an influencer, uh, movies, books, television, podcasting, uh, mobile DJ. I know you did L.A. Productions. Uh, I guess I've known you and you and Lee, your bride there for Lord knows how many years. We lived on the same street uh, in, uh, in the South Charlotte for years, and I told people that we borrowed rakes and you know uh, things from each other. Uh, so. 
when did when did you leave uh, when did you leave the on air radio world and get into I guess you're doing um, podcasts and things yeah. these days and interviews you're still in you're still in the media yeah what happened was is that in 2011 I saw a television commercial for for Chevy that said that Wi Fi was going to be in cars and that that was a wake up call for me and I looked at my wife and I said I've got to be in that car because I think that's where people are going and so then what happened was is that while being a production director for iHeart Radio uh, I was I was putting together all of my podcasts because I wanted to be you know the, in in this this Wi Fi world inside people's cars and then and I I remember them looking at me going, what are you doing again? And they would say, just keep doing it. We don't know what you're doing, but just keep doing it. And, and, and that's what I really tried to do was, was to create a platform where I could reach out there and, and, and really share stories with, with these musicians, you know, just like Casey would do or just like the inside sleeve of an album. So, uh, and I know one of your, is the podcast called Unplugged and Totally Uncut? Is that what you're still running? That's one of 14 that I do. Oh, just 14. Yeah, okay, yeah well, I, I just do 14 podcasts. That's it. <laughs> So, uh, are, do, are we talking to stars? Are we talking up and coming, established, or who are we talking to? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what. In about 35 minutes, I'm going to be with Jane Seymour, so you tell me. Ah, that's pretty good. She looks pretty good, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. Not too bad. Medicine, uh, what was it? Medicine woman, I think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's cool. And I know for a long time, you had something that you were doing movies and things. Uh, you I still were doing, do. uh, 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 doing the, what are those, the, the previews and the preview showings and stuff like that before the movie comes out? Oh, yeah. Like, I've, I've already seen Planet of the Apes. I've seen the new Mad Max movie. I see movies two and three weeks in advance. And, and it really, it's working one on one with the promotions department with, with the, you know, the biggest movie companies around the world. So uh, when, when did you leave? You were on the air doing a regular show, what, at, uh, at, at uh, uh, WBT or uh, BCY? And, and when did you leave the broadcast air? And then really started started things up. So that, that, was in, that was in 2016. It was shortly after my father's passing. And I really felt like that my father was the one that pushed me out the door. He says, you need to get on with your life and do something, make a difference. And I thought that this new frontier called podcasting was going to be that frontier. That's fantastic. Have we uh, been able to monetize this? So we got stuff coming in the bank account. Yeah, but it's, and that's the one. I'm so glad that you brought that up because a lot of people think they can do a podcast, but do they have the dedication, the loyalty, and the determination? And it reminds me so much of what Dan Miller told me up at Cook Radio back in the 1980s. And he said that anybody can be on the radio, but can they do it six days in a row and make every show brilliant? And you know, it's funny that you say that, Errol. When I left Atlanta, um, McKee, I used to talk to Gary McKee down there. Yeah. I think Gary was making when I left. Oh, gosh, when I left in 84, Gary was making 600 a year. So that was pretty good money. Uh, I'm back in 84, and it's a lot of money these days. But he was doing a four-hour shift, and he owned Atlanta. He was there 17 years. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, when I came up this way, I kind of was – he was my, my mentor. And, uh, and I said, so – he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to do you. And he said, uh, what well, I've learned from you. And he said, I don't know if you can be – I don't know if you can be brilliant every day, but you can be pretty darn good. Yeah. And you want that consistency is what you're looking for every single day. Uh, can you stay with, uh, with another break here? Have you got time to stay for another break? Absolutely. And talk about Absolutely. All right. I'm glad you said yes. It's on the script there. You should have said yes. You know that. All right. So stay with us. We're, we're visiting with Errol Collins. Uh, he did he did lose out to Shadow Stevens. Who's still doing the countdown? Is Shadow still doing the countdown for for? Uh, has they buried Casey yet? Is Casey in the ground yet? Boy, 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 isn't that the biggest mystery? I heard that he's over in Sweden and that they're they're, they're trying to the family's trying to bring him back home, but they're, they're having a tough time. Gene kept the kids from him toward the end yeah. when he was sick, and at eighty million dollars, he he amassed a fortune of almost a hundred million dollars. So that's what it was all about, and it was awful there toward the end and stuff. But I still love the uh, the Casey Kasem countdowns and things. Well, around the corner and around the nation, we're on our way to a brand new number one, and we'll do that before the hour's <laughs> up. I can tell you that. All right, we're talking with Errol Collins this morning. Hang with us; we're going to come right back. The name of this show is on Second Thought. Chuck Boozer on WHKY. Stay with us; we're going to come right back. Arrow, I was just reading through. Uh, you started in Billings, Montana. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, K O O K O Y N K O O K. W E C C in Charlotte in '85 through '91. W A Q Q from '91 to '93. W L N K from '93 to '05. You've written three books, two novels, two books of inspiration, articles for Music and Lifestyle magazine, movie critic for Pam Stone Show, and. Uh, you were hooked up with Bob and Sherry at one time there, and just kind of, you've done whatever you need to do here. My gosh, you've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know what to say except for thank you. I mean, I, I thank God every day for this opportunity because I believe that that's exactly where I'm supposed to be. He, he's the one that, uh, that put me on this microphone to help reach out there with people. Well, I want to thank you for sending me that list of things that you've done. That's what I want to thank you for. <laughs> no. <laughs> 
I'm, t- I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Uh, let's see. What's it like growing up in Billings, Montana? I remember when you first got here. This is kind of a culture shock. And at, at that time, 85, 86, it was a little different. Uh, what's Billings? Billings back in 85, 86, I think, was used to tell us it was about 50,000 people. You can know almost everybody in town. And then you came to, quote, unquote, the big city of Charlotte. It was culture shock, was it not? Absolutely. It sure was. And it was what I think one of the biggest shocks about it was the fact that, um, you know, the, this y'all thing. I mean, I, I just didn't understand what y'all was. And I, and, and the, so, but, I, but I'll tell you what, I bought a book from the old, uh, um, the mall that was in downtown by the radio station and and it taught me how to understand southern accents i mean it really did help me so that when people would call me from albemarle or they'd call me from gaston county then i I had a better understanding of of what they were saying had you never been out anywhere outside of billings montana before you came to charlotte did you grow up there is that where you were from Uh, i was i was born in sheridan wyoming but i mean i I went as far south as uh denver and as far west as uh seattle so i mean but and and canada i love canada yeah but you came from an area where it's kind of sparse up there. Uh, it's kind of sparse in between cities and people and cows and everything else. I mean, it's just like open territory. That's a lot up there. That's a lot. Was that a real culture shock coming here? And and uh, Charlotte was only up and up and coming back in the eighties. Then we just got in the bus mall. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, it was it was a culture shock only because I my entire life I knew that I didn't belong in Billings. I I knew that I was going to be somewhere else, and and so I prepared myself for that all the way through my my education. Is that it, I knew I was going to be in radio. I knew that radio was not going to keep me in Billings. I wanted out of there as quickly as possible. So I mean I think that's the reason why I got married at the age of eighteen, so I could get on with my life and and get out of Montana. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, and uh, still married to Lee. Yeah. How many years? Thirty two years. <laughs> 32 years. Congratulations. Thank wow. you. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure she's uh, she's in line with my wife to get those medals. Because everybody goes, there's a medal for being with you. Yes, I've heard that a couple of times. Yes. So uh, what all are you doing these days? Are you still working for Harris Teeter? Yes, I love it. I mean, Chuck, I'll tell you what. What I love about that is the fact that I get to see real people. In radio, we envision people. And so when I when I was there at the register for the very first time, I just couldn't believe the, sh- the shock. I mean, you talk about a culture shock. I was with real Real people. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I can tell that you love that too because I've talked to you many times. All right, listen, I know you've got another call coming up, so we're going to cut you cut you off here and, and, and let you go because I know you got another interview to do. But I'm going to have everybody on the station here that I've ever worked with, <laughs> just about uh, in all these years because there's so many great people like you. We've had Jim Schaefer on. I want to get the Eggman on. I want to get Liz on. I wow. want to get uh, Bobby Lane and all these people. Boomer still around. Yeah, stuff. he is. So, oh, we, we grew up with it, or part of, at least were part of my life and part of my pages in my life. Uh, and I'm just, I'm so proud to call you a friend still, Errol. Mm-hmm. You're, one of the, you're one of the nicest people I know. You're one of the best people I know. And I'm, I'm really proud. I mean that. And you're such a good radio dog. And I mean that with <laughs> all, all the respect. You know, you, you just still love radio and stuff. So really appreciate you coming and talking with us for a little while this morning. Thank you. You got to come on to my podcast, okay, so I can ask you questions next time. <laughs> I'm an open book. That's no problem. We'd be happy to. My people people call your people, which means I'll call you, of course. You know what that means. Well, you be brilliant today, okay? I'll try my best. Thanks, Errol.